third verse for Third verse for uh, no, Sharon. Pete, you run running the. Are you the one running the slides? On the third verse for George of the World. I don't have Pete for that. So, man, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> That's half of you. Well, good morning. Thank you for coming to worship with us today. I trust you had a grand, glorious Thanksgiving. If you would, stand to your feet and let's praise the Lord.
love you all here today. It's so good to see you after the Thanksgiving break. It's so good to see everyone who's come out this morning. We just want to welcome you, and we want to get to know our guests, our first-time guests. If you're our first-time guest here today, in the seat right in front of you is a welcome card. We'd love to for you to grab one of those, fill it out so we can get to know you. If you're watching online, if you go to bfchurch.com and click on the Guest tab, there's just a few lines there to fill out so we can get to know you, if you have any prayer requests. And at this time, we have Miss Jackie who's going to do our scripture reading. Good morning. Psalm 1, 100. Psalm 100, 1 through 5. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Lord, we humbly come before you in Jesus' name with all praise. Because you are worthy, Lord. We thank you, not just during this season of, of celebration and holidays, but every day, Father of the year. It is an honor to serve you. Anoint this time and the music and the prayers, Lord, that we bring up to you today and the sermon that will be preached. Open the eyes and the ears of the people, Lord. And it's in your holy name we come and bless you. Amen. Please remain standing as we continue to worship.
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, greetings from all of us at the Magnolia campus to you. Praise the Lord. We're glad to be over here. Pastor Joe, Pastor Gary are out, so you're stuck with third string. So uh, hopefully the third string, third string quarterback won't uh, throw any interceptions, but uh, it's good to be over here and uh, be with you again and be able to see all the all the old faces, I don't mean old in the sense of age, but old faces, you know what I mean. So said, so you're not starting out very well, Pastor Deb. So, um, but anyway, uh, go, always good to be here and be with, here with you and be able to share God's word with you today as we look uh, 
today at the benefits of having a thankful heart. You may be saying, isn't that what Pastor Joe preached on last Sunday? Well, he basically looked at developing a spirit of gratitude, and so now we're going to look at uh, the benefits that come when you have a grateful spirit to the Lord, because it does come with benefits of having that grateful, that thankful spirit. There's great benefit that go with it that I believe will encourage us all to have more of a a grateful spirit to, uh, excuse me, the others, and to Lord Jesus Christ for all that he's done in our life. So um, let me see where ours is up here. There it is, a little different one than what we have at Magnolia. So let's begin to look at four things that I believe are benefits to our life if we'll have that thankful spirit. Number one is a thankful heart is required for us to be in God's will. It says in everything, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. As I said, we can't give necessary thanks for everything, but we can in everything. Something negative happened, we don't say, I'm glad I, you know, lost my job, you know, but I can say, hey, in this job, in this loss, things can work out for good. So we give thanks because it's God's will. There's things in Scripture that are clearly spoken of what God's will is. And there are things that maybe aren't as clear, like who do I marry? What, do I go to college or don't go to college? Do I take this job or not take this job? Do I move here or not move here? I mean, those things you're not going to see in Scripture, thou shalt marry Bob Smith. I mean, you've got to ask God and go with the principles that are in Scripture, but it won't be laid out clearly with the name. However, if you're going to find God's will of what you don't find in Scripture, you're going to have to do the things that are God's will that are spelled out in Scripture. Uh, Let me put it this way. I can't find my car keys unless I'm in the right room that my car keys are in. You can't find what it is you're looking for that's not revealed unless you're in the room that is revealed, which is God's revealed will, which one of those is to give thanks in everything. So that means if I'm not giving thanks and everything, I'm not in God's will. And so if I'm not in his revealed will, can I discover what the thing, other things are? I don't believe so. I think we need to. And this society that we live in is a very ungrateful society. Uh, it's becoming more and more like that day in and day out. And that's predicted. Second Timothy talked about in the last days. And then in verse 2, it goes on to describe those things. And one of those things is men will be ungrateful. That's a sign of the times. That's a sign that we're in the end times as people just aren't grateful. They, they want their government to do more. They want their spouse to do more. They want their work to do more. Everybody has to do and do and more and more. There's not enough satisfaction in people's lives. They're not grateful for anything. It always has to be more. Give more. Do more. Expect more from everybody except themselves. They're not really being grateful. It's a very ungrateful society. Matter of fact, there's a show on TV I like to watch. It's called I Survived. I don't know if you watch. It's about three people each episode of people that are just, that just shouldn't have survived. I mean, you know, some ladies up there saying, I got shot 42 times, you know, and, and then she's still talking to you. You know, she survived. You know, I, about, I was out in the snow 100 miles away from civilization and, you know, I broke my leg and I couldn't go anywhere. And this guy just happened to be walking by with his dog. And he saw me, you know, and just, it's amazing. And then the whole thing culminates where all three people say, how did you survive? And almost all of them say, well, it was my willpower. It's, I was just, I, I was smart enough to know what to do. Now, I'm not really in the habit of talking to the TV set because I know the TV set can't hear. But I do, it's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Your willpower, how did you make that guy just happen to walk by? I mean, won't you just thank God? You know, and a few of those people said, I really prayed, I prayed. You heard it in their testimony at the end. They said, well, I really survived because I had willpower. It's like you just said you prayed. You couldn't give God the glory and thank him. It's like we live in such a thankless society that's completely out of God's will. You know, it's said that a lady one time got on the bus and she walked and a man got up to give his seat to the lady, and the lady fainted. And they woke her back up and said, why would you faint? said, I couldn't believe a man would actually give up his seat for a lady. And then the lady went over and thanked the man who did it, and then he fainted. They woke him up and said, how would you faint? He said, I didn't know anybody was that grateful anymore. 
Is that, that's the society we live in. Nobody is really thankful. Everybody expects everybody to be a certain way and do a certain way, and we don't give thanks for it. So the best attitude you can ever have is an attitude of gratitude. I don't know who came up with words in our English language, but maybe that guy wanted them to rhyme so we'd remember it. The best attitude is an attitude of gratitude because it brings the most benefit, I believe, to our life. You know, the, the second thing that is a benefit is a thankful heart helps bring peace into our life. It says in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious, that's wor worried, don't, to, don't be anxious, be anxious for what? Nothing. In other words, don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, you can't com comprehend it, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, a lot of people say, well, I do pray, and I do bring my supplication, but do you bring it with thanksgiving? Because you've only done part of the formula. It's not a Hocus pocus, but part of the formula is you've got to be thankful so that you can receive the peace of God. Everybody's looking for peace. Everybody's always looked for peace. I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. You know, we had peace signs and all that, you know, peace. And, I, of course, I didn't know what all that meant, you know, as a kid. Just, hey, it's cool to do that, you know. But what they were looking for was peace, whether it was world peace, inner peace. Everybody's looking for peace. You know, I don't care if they're lost, saved, rich, poor, you know, what race, what economic, everybody's looking just to have peace in their spirit, to, to not be in turmoil, just to have some peace. And, and, and here it's telling us how to do that. We pray, which we know that. We offer what we need from God, but we do it with thanksgiving. Matter of fact, another verse equal to it. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be what? Thankful. There he is again. The word peace and the word thankful. The word peace and the word thankful. They, they go together. And as I begin to look at this, I, it's kind of like a, in college you have prerequisite courses. You have to take this course before you can take that course. It's kind of like before you're going to have peace, you have to have a thankful heart. Then you can go toward peace. I began to do some research on thankfulness and began to look it up on the Internet, and it's amazing how much you can get hits on where universities have done studies on thankfulness. These are secular universities. Uh, even one was from the Mayo Clinic website, you know, where these, these colleges, these universities, these medical schools, they, they did all this research to prove how good it was to be thankful in all things. You see, they showed that relationships improve with thankfulness. If you're married and you're not grateful, you may say, well, they're my spouse, they ought to do those things. Well, that's why your marriage is as bad as it is. You know, that's the worst attitude you could have. You've got to be thankful for what they do, because what we do, we expect certain people to do certain things. That's your job. That's your description. And so there's no gratitude. You want to do something that will prove not only your marital relationship, but all relationships, be thankful and grateful. People love to be around grateful people, and people don't like being around ungrateful people. No amens. But that is a fact about our life of how who we're drawn to. We're drawn to grateful people. You know, you got the guy, you know, he, he, the wife's always saying, he doesn't do anything around my house. He won't do a repair one. But he goes off to the neighbors. He goes off to this person's house, and he does repairs there, but he won't do the repairs at my house. You know, but when he goes to the neighbor's house or the friend's house, and he puts in their ceiling fan, they're going, Oh, wow, thanks, man, that looks great. Kids, come in here, Mr. Johnson, look what he did. He must be, he must be a genius. Look, he wired that, and he put those wire nuts on there. And, and look, that ceiling fans works. Hey, let's give Mr. Johnson a big round of applause. He's the greatest. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Then he goes home and does it, and the wife says, well, it's about time you got that done. And you wonder why he wants to do the repairs at the neighbor's house. Because there's gratitude. You know, why does the wife do cook pies and cookies for neighbors and friends and not for the husband. 
You know, the neighbors and friends, oh, thank you, those are the best, that was the best dessert I ever ate. Man, that was great. Man, thank you so much. At home, husband may say, well, it's about time you got in the kitchen. You know, gratitude is the right attitude for all relationships. And guess what? Scientists have proven that's what works. That's the key factor in good relationships versus bad relationships. Bad relationship, well, I expect this, and I expect a little more, and expect a little more, and you should be doing a little more, and you should be, other ones, man, I'm grateful. I know these other things need to improve and may improve, but I'm grateful for what I have now. Even if the other doesn't, I'm grateful for what I do have. I'm grateful for what I do see. And boy, that makes all the difference in the world. The same, same research found out that your health, your mental health will improve. It showed in these studies it reduces stress, it reduces depression, and it helps with self-esteem. It also proved in these studies that it improves physical health. It increases energy, it helps with strengthening the immune system, it decreases blood pressure, and it improves sleep. All that without appeal. Can you believe secular people would say in the universities, this is all done without medicine? This is all done for free. You don't have to even go to a doctor to improve all of these things. You'll just be more grateful. And I'm amazed that they even came out with that. You'd think they would even hide that. You know, say, well, it's got to be medicine or it's got to be surgery. It's got to be something greater than just that. But isn't it amazing how science and the uh, institutions finally catch up with what God's words already said? Just open to Philippians 4, 6. You didn't have to waste all that taxpayer money on all that research. It told us right there, if you're thankful, you can get peace. And that's what all this is. You can have peace in your relationship. You can have peace in your heart. You can have peace in your mental condition. You can have peace. It's in Philippians 4, 6. It's in Colossians 3, 15. It's like how long did we have to wait before science caught up with the Bible that said the earth is a sphere? Oh, no, the earth is flat. We discovered the earth is round. The Bible said that thousands of years ago. Just open your Bible. But science finally catches up with what the Bible has said for years and years. All we have to do is read our Bible. We don't need surveys. God's word's always true. You say, well, Pastor Tim, how can you have this peace, though? How can that be a benefit when my life is in turmoil and I've got troubles, I've got trials, and I've got difficulties? How can you expect to have peace in the midst of that? Now, that's usually when I'm anxious for everything. I've got difficulties that I can't explain. I've got health concerns I can't explain. I've got financial situations. I've got all kind of stuff. How can I have peace in the midst of all of this? We'll be thankful. Well, how can I be thankful? Well, remember that verse, Romans 8, 28. God works all things together. He causes all things to work together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. He works all things together for good. And if you really believe that, if I really believe that, in the midst of my negative, I'm saying, I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to work all this together for good and so I can have some peace about this. His word said he's going to do it. He's going to work it together. I don't know how it's going to work, but it's going to work. Well, when I was a kid, I used to love going to my grandparents uh, up in Brenham. And my grandmother, they lived in a 1914 old farmhouse. And, of course, my grandmother made everything from scratch. And she made homemade bread. And, man, you took that flour and took that, all that stuff you put in to make bread. And she just would take that stuff and mix it all together. And then she'd not only mix it, she'd take her hands in it and just stretch it. It looked like she was mad at it. I mean, she'd stretch it and pull it and tug it and rub it and stretch it again and push. Well, I found out later that's called kneading the dough. And you got to just keep it. It's like, man, she must be mad at that dough. And she'd work it. You know what she was doing? She was working that stuff together. All these ingredients that nobody likes. Nobody likes to eat flour. Nobody likes to eat salt. But, boy, when you take all that stuff and she was just working it together for good. Man, she was stretching it, and she was doing it all kind of, kind of way. And then, you know, and I found out from some research that the reason you do that, because if you don't do that, bread will develop what they call gas pockets, and you'll have holes all in your bread. Sometimes you buy bread from the store, and it's got more holes than it's got bread. 
You got to need it more. And another thing is that's beneficial about this is if you don't need it enough, it won't rise. Be flat bread. Nobody wants to eat flat bread. And then if you don't need it enough, it won't be the right texture. It won't be fluffy and tender. It'll be all tough and chewy. My grandmother's wasn't tough and chewy. It was fluffy. It rose. It didn't have any air pockets in it. But see, that's what she was doing. She was working out, getting what needed to be out, out. And God's working to get what's in you out that doesn't need to be in there. And he wants you to rise to a new level in your spiritual walk and not just be all just flat. I think two or three people are getting what I'm trying to say. And then he wants you to be the right texture. Some of you are too tough and chewy. He wants you tender and fluffy and have a tender heart that's easy for him to talk to and convince to do what he wants you to do. Okay, now we got four people on board. So God's going to work in you enough. And you say, well, this don't seem like fun. I'm sure the doe's thinking, would you please stop? That's enough. But what is enough needing? Well, I found out that there's a deal called the window pane theory on dough and that they get it thin enough to where you can hold it up and if you can see the light through it, it's enough. Jesus is the light. When he shows through to you, that's enough. He's worked out enough in you. And then my grandmother put it in an oven and got it hot. See, sometimes you, you feel like, man, I've had enough of this kneading and now the, the Lord throws you in an oven at 350. And you think, how long do I have to stay in here? How long did I have to be kneaded now? How long do I have to stay in the oven? When you have a good cook like my grandmother, she knew exactly how long to knead it and how long to cook it. Not a minute more, not a minute less. It was kneaded just the right amount of time, and it was cooked the right amount of time. And I never heard her once in the kitchen ever ask the dough, how long you want to be kneaded? I never had her ask the, the dough once, how long do you think we ought to keep you in this hot oven of trials? Because that was the master chef's decision of how long. But what you can do, if you trust that verse, in the hard times you can say, I'm thankful for this because I know you're working this out together for my good. I don't know how. I don't know what. I don't know where. That's beyond my ideal. I'm only the dough. But you're the baker, and I know you want me to be tender, and I want the light to shine through me. And if this is what it takes, then I can have the peace of God knowing when I get through this, I'm going to be shining like Jesus. And I'm going to have peace in this because I'm going to trust you to work this out together for good, to just blend it and need it. You know what? I think we all need to be able to say to the Lord in peace, I need to be needed. I know how you spelt that. You spelt that N-E-E-D-E-D, because I want to be needed. But no, you need to say, I not only be needed N-E-E-D-E-D, I need to be needed K-N-E-A-D-E-D. Okay, because there's some of us that need to be needed some more to get out a few more air pockets and a few more tenderizers that we need to do that. But we can thank God in the midst, because who wants to be half-baked? I don't want to be a half-baked person. I want to be full-baked. I want the Lord to do in me what he needs to do, and I can have peace in the midst of difficulty. Because isn't that when we need peace? A lot of people, I mean, we need peace all the time, but usually when things are going good, you know, we're kind of at peace. But when things are going bad, that's when we need it. But we can go to that verse and we can say, Lord, I can bring my prayer to you, and I can do it with thanksgiving because I know you're going to work this out together for my good. The third thing that's a benefit from being a thankful person is a thankful heart helps bring contentment in your life. First Timothy 6, 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by something, <laughs> when it has a partner, and that partner is contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, so we can take, we won't take anything out either. That's right, there's no hearses on, there's no U-Hauls on the end of a hearse. And you came in with nothing, you heading out with nothing. Nothing in, nothing out. Whatever you made, whatever you earn, whatever you possess, it's staying here. And we got to be content with what we have. we got to be content with things. And you see, thankfulness breeds contentment. You can't have contentment unless you first have thankfulness. 
That's what it brings. I saw a definition of, of those two items. It says thankfulness is being grateful for what you have. Contentment is being satisfied with what you have. See, when I'm thankful, that means I'm grateful for what I have. And then I hit contentment after that, and then I become satisfied with what I have. You don't mean you don't want more? I can maybe want more, but I'm going to be content with what I am because I may not get any more. And having more may not, is not going to bring me any more satisfaction. John D. Watt Rockefeller, the richest man that was at that time, said, I have my millions, but they have brought me no happiness. John D. Rockefeller. Henry Ford, who had all kind of wealth after he had created the Ford Empire, said this, I was happier as a mechanic. And I could go on and on. It's like, it's not what you have. It's just, are you content or not with what you have? Because that great spirit brings that kind of contentment in our life. It brings that kind of joy in our life. But but our life is full of things that bring discontent. Every commercial is a discontentment. You deserve more. You deserve better. What you have is not enough. This isn't enough. That's how the commercials work. So they convince you you are not content unless you have this. And if you had this, then you'd be. No, you wouldn't because you want one more thing. Even Adam and Eve weren't content. I, mean, I don't know how many trees there were in the garden. There might have been thousands. God said, hey, eat it all. I mean, knock yourself out. Enjoy. Just don't eat on this one. They were so ungrateful, they said, well, we're eating of that one. It's like, you're not grateful for all these others? Just, I gave you all of it. No, we've got to have that one that we can't have. I mean, that's, that's the sinful nature that we have. We're always wanting what we don't have. But peace can come when we see and are thankful for what we do have. I believe that we kind of go through life holding two buckets. We have this bucket over here that's trials and difficulties and disappointments and health problems and financial problems and all kind of hard, difficult things in our life. And then we have this bucket over here, which are the blessings of God and things that God provides for us and things that God gives us and how he overcomes some things and how he heals us many times. And we have all these things that are positive in our life. And I think we walk through life holding both those buckets. But the bucket we look in is going to be the issue of our gratefulness. If we're always staring in what we don't have and all that, that and not looking at God, you always look at all that. No matter when I'm walking with this, I look over here and I see this is always alongside me. You saved me. You loved me. You got me through this. You saved me back then from even dying. You saved my soul. You, you brought me through this and this and this. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, but Pastor Tim, you got this over here. I'm not looking at that. I know that's always going to be there, but I'm going to look at this. I'm going to joy in this. I'm going to be thankful for this. But, Pastor Tim, look over at that bucket. I'm, I know that bucket's there. And it's always going to be there some bad stuff. Because it just seems like there's always some bad stuff. But I'm going to be thankful for this bucket. Do you keep praying? Yeah. You keep asking God? Yeah. But i got to be able to look at the right bucket. And there's always something to thank the Lord for. Many of you are familiar with Matthew Henry. Many of you have his commentary. He has a commentary of the whole Bible. Many of you have it in your, maybe your library. And he was a great preacher in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And back then he was robbed on the street. And then after the robber left with what he had, he says that he looked up to the Lord and said he thanked the Lord at that moment for four things. He said, Lord... Thank you that I've never been robbed before in my life, that this is the first time. And then he said, Lord, thank you that he took my money and not my life. And Lord, thank you that he took everything I had, but that wasn't much. And then he said this, and Lord, also thank you that I was robbed and I wasn't the robber. Because that could have been me on the other end. But I'm not. We can thank the Lord in every situation. Because the Lord can bring contentment because we're thankful and we see what the Lord's given us. Hey, even if you just thought, thank the Lord for what he's left out of your life, things that he hadn't brought into your life, that's enough to make a long list. 
Lord, you hadn't done this, and I hadn't had to go through that, and hadn't had to experience that, and I'm still alive. And I mean, you can just keep thanking the Lord for what he hadn't allowed to happen in your life. Not what he has brought in, but what he's kept from. We can be thankful for and have that thankful spirit. What a benefit that is to let it breed contentment. Not only breed peace, but then allow it to bring contentment, that satisfaction with life, because that's what that, those university surveys came up with the final conclusion. Thankfulness helps bring satisfaction to your life. That's, that's all they could come up with as a conclusion. And isn't that what you want, satisfaction with life? We look at and we close with one last point. And as a thankful heart helps motivate us to worship and serve God, to worship and serve God. Two examples, I think. First of all, we look at the verse that uh, Jackie read for us. Enter his courts with what? Thanksgiving. In his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. How do you enter into the courtroom? How do you enter into the gates of the Lord? With what? Thanksgiving. You know, I've often thought, if the Lord has gates to enter his presence, and the Lord set up a passcode that you had to type in, I wonder if the Lord's passcode to get in would be the word thanksgiving. Right? How do I enter his gates? A lot of people think, well, they're locked to me. Well, it's because you hadn't been thankful to get in. He's telling me to enter his gates. I need to enter them with what? Thanksgiving. And in his courts. Got to enter his courts with what? Praise. To give him thanks. That's part of my worship, is giving him thanks for what he's done, for who he is. A couple of examples of that. We won't stay long on this one. Brother Joe mentioned it last week was the ten lepers. Remember the ten lepers? Jesus healed them all. Leprosy is a bad thing. It was a bad disease. There was no hope, no cure. Just wither away. And it was painful death. And then Jesus healed all ten of them. They all asked him to heal, and he healed them all. They left. He sent them away to go to the priest. But one of them, one of them turned back. And here's what the one that turned back said. Now, one of them, when he saw that he'd been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his feet, his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. He said, you know, I just can't keep on going. See, a lot of people, they love the gift. They don't love the giver of the gift. I'm sure all them were saying, "Woohoo! look at this. I've been healed. I got stuff to do now. I hadn't done all this stuff in a long time. Man, I can start enjoying life. For the first time, I can really enjoy. I don't have time to be going back. I got to enjoy my life. All these blessings that God's given me, I'm going to enjoy them. The deal is you forgot the giver. The giver gave the gift, and now your enjoyment is what's keeping you from coming back to thank the giver. That still happens a lot today. There's a lot of people that don't come back to the Lord to serve him and love him because they're too busy with the benefits of all that he's given them. Oh, I got second house and third houses, and I got this and I got that. I don't have time for God. I just got to enjoy all the blessings from God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Jesus is saying, why don't you come back? Don't be like those nine lepers that just want to enjoy what they got. He brags on the one that came back to say, hey, I'm thankful. Jesus asked, where's the other nine? Ten percent? I wonder if that's our ratio today. 10% of people want to live to thank God? What's the motivation? Thankfulness. That's what got him back. That's what motivated his worship. That's what motivated him to fall at the feet of Jesus with his face. Say, man, I wouldn't have what I have if it weren't for you. I'm grateful. I'm here because I'm grateful. I don't know about those other nine guys, but I'm grateful. I wonder if that would have been us. Would we be one of the nine to come back and worship the Lord and worship the giver 
more than the gift. Another example is the sinful woman. We call her that because the scripture refers to her that in, in Luke 7. Simon, the Pharisee, had Jesus come over to his home and had a banquet. And this woman, who they refer to as the sinful woman, which many believe she was a prostitute, a woman of the street, an immoral woman, obviously, to have that categorized of her. And so she walks in, which wasn't uncommon for people on the street because the doors were left open and they knew guest speakers were there. And so she went in knowing Jesus was there. And when she came in, she goes to Jesus and she goes to his feet and she begins crying and weeping so much that the tears are providing water to wash his feet and so much water from the tears that she takes her hair and dries off the tears and wipes and dries his feet as she cleans them with his tears. And then she begins to kiss his feet over and over again. And then she takes perfume that she brought in and anoints his feet with that perfume. Of course, Simon the Pharisee, he's irate. He's thinking to himself, if, if this Jesus says he's a prophet, obviously he must not be here. He'd know what kind of woman that is doing that to him. I mean, he can't be a prophet knowing what kind of woman that is. Jesus, knowing his thoughts, gives a little parable and says, Simon, he basically tells him this. He said, there was a money lender that had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50 denarii. 50 and 500. So I got my calculator out. The denarii is a day's wage. And I said, well, what if somebody worked eight hours a day today and they made $15 an hour and they worked 50 days and they made $15 an hour and worked eight hours a day and they worked 500 days, what would that be? Well, that would be about $6,000 for the 50-day guy and about 60000 for the 500-day guy. So in today's vernacular, let's call it 6000 and 60000 So the money lender has two guys, one owes 6000 one owes 60000 let's say, because the parable is basically it's ten times as much. And Jesus said, if the money lender forgave them both and told them both, you don't owe me anything anymore, I forgive the debt, which one would lay most? And Simon says, well, I suppose... I don't know why he said, I suppose. It's an easy answer because he thought Jesus was trying to trick him or something. I suppose the one who was forgiven the most debt. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. And you're thinking, well, is he saying that certain one of us have more sins than other? No, it's not the amount of the sin. It's the awareness of our sin. I'm going to say that one again. It's not the amount of our sin, it's the awareness of our sin. See, Simon wasn't aware of any of his sin. He had just as much sin as the prostitute. How do you mean that? Well, she was doing the sin of prostitution. He was doing the sin of pride, ego. I'm the Pharisee. Of course, I'm not down like that woman over there. Well, that's pride. That's sin. Yeah, but sin's not as bad as, pride's not as bad as. Who are you to judge what's the bigger or littler sin? <laughs> Who are any of us? It wasn't, the parable's not about, did you commit more sins than somebody else? It's the awareness of your sin. We ought to look at all of our sin the same. Whatever sin I did, that caused Jesus to die on the cross for me. And whatever a mass murderer did, Jesus died for his sin too. And I should look at my sin as, Lord, whatever I did or didn't do, it caused you to die on the cross for me. And I'm most grateful because I was forgiven a lot. Yeah, but Tim, were you, were you forgiven? As, I'm not looking at anybody else to compare. The Bible says that's not wise to compare. We all had enough sin for Jesus to die on the cross for us. Whether it was a sin of jealousy or envy or murder or prostitute. The parable's not about that. It's just how aware was I of my sin and how bad it was to me and how grateful I am for the Lord to forgive me of it. And then Jesus turns to the woman but speaks to Simon. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. 
she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. She has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which for many have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Was he saying she was saved because of what she did? No, we're saved by grace, not by works. You see the terminology and the, the, uh, the tense of the verbs? She has been forgiven. She had already been forgiven. Sometime in the past, she came to know Christ as her Savior. She's saved. She's coming in this building already saved. She didn't get saved by what she just did in those works because we're not saved by works. She's doing those works because she wants to show her gratitude to Jesus for forgiving a lady like her. And we need to be that grateful that he would save somebody like us. But if we're not aware, I was just a little sin. I wasn't really that bad. I grew up in church. No wonder there's not people that come and say, I want to serve the Lord. Because if we think we've been forgiven little, we love little. But if we think we've been forgiven much, we love much. And it's all the awareness of our sin, of how grateful we are. The people that are most grateful love more, serve more, commit more, because they're more grateful. You're the same way. If somebody bought you lunch, would you be the same grateful if they said, I'm buying you a brand new house, I'm buying you land, I'm buying you all new cars, and I'm putting a million dollars in your bank? Would you think, well, I'm just as grateful for him buying lunch as that guy did? No, you wouldn't. Be honest. This guy did a lot more for you than this guy. And you'd probably be more grateful. Jesus died on the cross for whatever sins we committed or will commit. That's how grateful this woman was. She loved the Lord. She wanted to show him in a tangible way. Thank you. You say, can you pay back the Lord? No. You can't pay him back. That's just unpayable. But you know what? With the parable of the money lender, you realize that any money lender that forgives the debt, somebody had to pay for it. Right? I mean, when this guy forgave the debt, he absorbed the six. 60000 and the 6000 he's out $66,000. Somebody had to pay it. It just doesn't go unpaid. That means he's got $66,000 empty hole in his bank account because he forgave a debt. It cost somebody. It cost the money lender. That's why Jesus used terms like debts to be the same thing as sins. Our sins had to be paid for. They were paid for by him. This money lender, he had to pay that debt that he forgave. It cost him. And it cost our Lord to do what he did for us. You know, the most trying time in my entire life, bar none, in 60, 61 years, the memory goes first is what I hear, so... I sure didn't want to add a one extra, but bar none was a time that I became most broken. And I remember praying this prayer, Lord, if you'll get me out of this, change this situation, then whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. You say, is that a right prayer or wrong prayer? Well, it's a right prayer, but it should be prayed every day, every moment, good times, bad times. You might have prayed a prayer like that. What I was saying was, Lord, I, I'd be so grateful that if you could do this, that I'd do whatever you asked me to do. But you have to understand that that's the prayer every day for every believer because when you made Jesus Savior and Lord, that's what you were asking. Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. But sometimes the Lord has to bring us through bad situations and negative situations for us to go back to that time and say, Lord, I need to tell you this again. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. But I'd be so, so grateful if you'd do this than whatever you'd ask me to do, I'll do. And he did. Little did I know that one day he'd say, quit your job at the school district and you need to come on staff of the church. Lord, anything else that you would ask me to do, I, no, no. <laughs> 
Lord, I got a real good job here. You know, but the, the Lord knows what it takes for us to obey with that kind of heart. And that's not just to become a preacher. That's to do whatever God's asking you to do. That you and I, whether we're going through a negative situation or not, right now we need to be saying this, Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. That's a blank check. You say, I'm not there. Well, maybe he may lead you to a bad situation like me that you will say that. I don't want you to. I didn't want to. But that's, I guess, what it took for me to get so broken that I'd say that prayer again, which that's the prayer you say at salvation. Lord, I'm making you Lord and Savior. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. But what happens is our thankfulness needs to be replenished again. You see, what the Lord has already done for me before that prayer was enough for me to be grateful for for the rest of my life. Just for dying on the cross for my sins, enough for me to thank him for the rest of my life. If he didn't answer another prayer from that time on or even that prayer, that should have been my prayer to say, well, Lord, whatever you want, I owe you everything. You've saved me. You died on the cross for me. But just think of all the things the Lord's done for us even after our salvation is enough to be thankful for forever and ever and ever. I think I've shared this story. I didn't, I didn't get a chance, opportunity of it, Magnolia to share it, but I may have shared it once before. I think it's so appropriate here in this sermon to close out. In 1959, there was a movie that came out called The Hanging Tree. In 1960, it was nominated for Academy Award. Basically, in the movie, a young man is shot, and he's left for dead. And somehow, somebody picks him up. I can't remember. I saw the movie. And, and they pick him up, and they get him to the old western. This is like back in the 1700s. They bring him to an old, old uh, town doctor, you know, in the old, old, old west. And he's just almost dead. And that doctor cuts him open and takes the bullet out, and he just doesn't know if he's going to survive. And day one and day two, they think he's not going to make it, and he's just lost so much blood. And, and the guy dresses him up, cuts him, and, and sews him up, and gives him a little water and food. He has to hand feed him like that for weeks and weeks. It looked like months in the movie. And he recovers, and he's back to normal. He's just as good as gold. And so the guy in the movie says to the doc, how can I thank you? How can I thank you? He said, well, that's interesting that you say that. Ever since I've been into this old town, said and the doctor here, I've always wanted an assistant, you know, somebody that could help me out to assist me in surgeries or helping people get better. I said, I'd like you to be my assistant. And so the guy says this question, well, how long do I need to be your assistant? And I'll never forget the doctor's answer. He said forever, because that's how long you'd have been dead if I wouldn't have saved you. <laughs> right? Forever, because that's how long you'd have been dead if I wouldn't have saved you. You know where I'm going with this? What I owe the Lord. I'd have been dead in my trespasses and sin if he wouldn't have saved me. So how long do I need to serve him? Forever, because that's how long you'd have been dead if I wouldn't have saved you. Or restored your family, or restored your marriage, or healed you back then, or gave you that, or got you that job, or gave you the smarts to work there, or the college education there, or the smarts to raise that kid, or to do that. Whatever I did, it came from me. And you served me forever. Because that's long, how long you'd been dead if I wouldn't have saved you and loved you and brought you through things. How much we owe the Lord. That's what thankfulness does. Even when we're burnt out, I don't feel like serving the Lord more. I don't have that passion like I used to. Well, the benefit of thankfulness is like it restores you back up. It fans the flame again saying, you know what? You're right. i got to fan this flame again. I need to serve him more. I need to be more committed. I need to be more faithful. At least until I die and face my Lord, I'm going to give it my all. You said, well, Pastor Tim, I thought you can't repay him. But you can't. 
This lady wasn't trying to pay him back. She wasn't crying and weeping and washing his feet to pay him back. She just said, this is the only way I know to thank him with my life. I got tears, I got hair, and I got some perfume. You may not have the ability to teach. You may not have the ability to sing. I don't know. I'm saying what you don't have, what you do have. That's all she had. And she said, I'll take what I got, and I'll serve him that way. A lot of people are waiting. Well, one day when I can teach or I can sing, I'll do it. God's not looking to get you to serve with what you don't have. He's just getting you to serve him and love him with what you do have. That's all we got until he comes back. And we look forward to those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And it's over. Time has, has been elapsed. Is that how we thank him? The benefit, I believe this one's the main benefit of our thankful heart is that it motivates me to worship him better, serve him better, because I'm doing it, realize how really, really thankful I am for all he's done to bless me so he's not blessing me as much as, there you go again. Just look at the bucket and what's in your bucket. Don't look what's in everybody else's bucket. <laughs> it's not a deal of comparison because we can all do that. So, well, you're doing that better and you, you no. Know, it's not wise to compare. Just appreciate what you do have and be content with it. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet. And as we just had this moment in time of invitation that we kind of draw a circle around our heart and our life and we're not worried about what somebody else got out of the message. We're thinking to ourselves, Lord, how did you speak to me? And so there where you are with your head bowed and your eyes closed and just uh, let the Lord speak to you. you. said, Pastor Tim, he's already spoke to me. Well, Take that in. Take it into your spirit. As the Lord's spirit is moving in this place, anytime his people and his spirit and his word and his worship are all in there, he's in our midst. He's in our heart if we know him. And so there where you are, maybe the first thing to say, Lord, am, am I thankful? Because I want to be in your will. And also to say, Lord, I want your peace, so I, I need to be thankful. Lord, I want contentment, so I need to be thankful. And Lord, I want to worship you, serve you, and Lord, I know that motivated by my thankfulness and gratitude. Maybe in the sound of my voice, there may be somebody that says, you know, Pastor Tim, I, I heard you talk about how grateful people are when they've had their sins forgiven by Christ and made him Savior and Lord because you can't split him apart. He's Savior. He saved me. He's Lord. I do whatever he says to do. And I, maybe you can't think of a time when you've done that. So gratitude can't be expressed because you've never been saved. Maybe you've never made him the Savior and Lord of your life. For you right now, it's time to do that. We'd be amiss to leave this place without giving you the opportunity to come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just ask him right where you are to forgive you and save you. Turn your life over to him. It's yours, Lord. You paid for it on the cross. Knowing that he died for your sin, knowing that he died on the cross, knowing that he was rose again on the third day to be victorious over death so that when you died, you would as well. That should have been us on the cross, but we couldn't pay for our own sin yet. He paid for the debt himself. It didn't cost us anything, but it cost him his life. He bore the debt of, of the sin. If that's you, then right in this place, what a better place to give the Lord your life and to ask him right where you are just to save you, and give you the strength to live for him from this day forward. And then thank him 
Thank him, thank him, thank him for cleansing you of your sins so that one day you could be in his presence. Because Jesus said, be ye perfect because my Father in heaven is perfect. The only way we can ever attain perfection is through his perfect sacrifice on the cross. Others who already know Christ, maybe you've let your commitment and faithfulness kind of wane. Maybe you've asked the Lord to restore that passion that he once had. I believe it all starts with thankfulness. Lord, I am grateful. Let those fan flames of gratitude reignite you today to love him more, serve him more, worship him more. Because we all have those times we fail and we just drift like sheep nibbling away. This is our chance to run back to the Savior and a new commitment. Maybe the Lord's, you've been attending here and maybe the Lord's leading you to join fellowship here. You know the Lord is your Savior, but you want to find a place to serve and to be committed to fellowship so you can serve the Lord and serve each other. I'll be up here at the front in just a moment. Maybe if you've come to know Christ, you come up here and share that with me or ask me how to do it. Maybe if you want to join the church, the Lord's leading you to do that. You make that decision or just want to pray at the altar. You do that as well, just between you and the Lord, whatever the situation is. Wherever may the trial you're going through is. Maybe you're just looking for that peace. Maybe you're looking for that answer. Maybe you want to be anointed for healing. Whatever it is. In a moment, you'll have that opportunity. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we commit this time to you. Pray that you would just be glorified and that your Holy Spirit would move in our midst to accomplish your will at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. As the band plays, you respond as the Lord leads you.
Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord that you're here. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be here. You'll get your first string team back soon, so next Sunday. So, amen. So, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, it's good. I always enjoy with Rebecca and I being able to be here with you and being able to fellowship. and look forward to seeing you after the service. Uh, I think I'm turning it over to Matt for some announcements. I'll be out in the lobby, greet any guests uh, out there at the guest table, and so... Uh, Look forward to seeing any of our guests. I'm sorry since I'm not here at the time. I don't know who's the guest. But if you come up to me there, I'll know you're a first-time guest. I'd like to see everybody else as well. So, Rebecca, I love you and appreciate each one of you and are thankful uh, for you in our life as well. We may be at another campus, but we're all one church and we're all one family. And so I uh, thank the Lord for you. So uh, uh, we praise God for you. Amen. So, Brother Matt. Thank you, Pastor Tim. So as we wrap up this Thanksgiving weekend, just remember tonight is a family night. We do not have evening services, so spend that time with your families and just be thankful for that. However, we do have Wednesday night service, so please be here on Wednesday night. Wednesday nights are 7 to 8 when we're picking our Bible studies back up. So don't have an excuse. Be here. Make sure that you're here. That's an amazing time. This Wednesday is our Fields of Faith. Now, we've done Fields of Faith in the past. We've done it in Magnolia. We've been here in the Klein Spring area. And what we're doing is our teenagers will be meeting at Spring Klein Memorial Stadium where FCA is putting on this event. In the past, they've had hundreds. They've had thousands of, of teenagers come out to this event. And it's just an incredible time of worship. Of uh, They're going to have guest speakers from the different high school, graduating seniors from these high schools speaking. And then a time where the, the students can go out on the field and have a time of prayer with the local church leaders. We have nine leaders from this church going out, so please be lifting them up in prayer. Also be lifting up our teenagers that will be attending that event. It's just an incredible time. Don't forget that this Saturday is our Women's Dessert Fellowship from 2 to 4. It's a great time, ladies, to come on out for, for fellowship. If you can attend, if you're here, fill out one of the, the forms on the table. Let us know that you're coming. Let us know if you're bringing guests, if you're bringing a dessert. If you are online, just comment below or, or to the right there and let us know that you're going to be here so we can be expecting you. We will have nursery for this. So, again, ladies, come on out. It's going to be a great time. If you are a first-time guest, I ask you guys to fill out the welcome card. At the end, when I dismiss you, you can go to the back and, and visit with Pastor Tim. If you're not a first-time guest, but you've been here a couple of times and you haven't had a chance to meet Pastor Tim yet, please go say hi to him. He'd love to get the chance to know you, get to see you. If you're online, remember, go to our BF Church website and click the Guest tab so we can get to know you as well. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. You can put those in the receptacle on your way out. You can drop those off Monday through Thursday during office hours. You can also tithe online, bfchurch.com. Click on the Give tab. It's just a great way to give back because God has given us so much. Before I discuss, I just want to let you guys know I've, I've been told that there's some food items in our, our kitchen. So please visit our kitchen on your way out. And you are dismissed. Dismissed.